Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. My name is Dennis Meralda. Today, I am joined by the founder and owner of Train for Life Strength and Conditioning, a former volunteer for the Special Olympics powerlifting team, a former mixed martial artist, fighter, a motivational speaker, a trainer, a coach, an overall badass, and just a really, really handsome man. Welcome, Ryan Durstein, to the Building Men Podcast. Nice to see you, man. Thanks, brother. Good to be on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We, we started the process. I tried to get you on a while ago. That was before I knew what the hell I was doing. And I still kind of don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm kind of faking until I make it a little bit. Um, yep. But we connected back in, I want to say, November timeframe. Yep. And I was just really interested in your in your journey. So talk to us a little bit about how you got started, maybe, you know, track back to where you first became interested in physical fitness and how you kind of went along your, your path to becoming the, the owner of Train for Life Strength and Conditioning. Yes, so uh, 2002, I was 20 years old. Uh, I was taking college courses. I was a criminal justice major. Uh, I thought that was the career path I wanted. Uh, the more I kind of got into it, delved into it, it was a lot of odd working hours, you know, if you wanted a family life, you know, you're going to be working nights, you're going to be working weekends, you're going to be working, you know, early morning, whatever. Um, kind of after about a year of courses, I, I kind of thought, I don't know if I want to do this. So I went down to the, um, you know, my advisor and just kind of sat in her office and said, I, I don't know what I want to do. So she, she did a great job of picking my brain, kind of finding out what, what, uh, what interested me. And uh, I've always played sports as a kid, but I also loved helping others. Um, and then I, and I just gotten into a, a training probably when I was about 16, 17, typical guy wanting to get, you know, get, get muscles, all this, all that, all that jazz. And then, uh, she's like, well, what if you got into, you know, health and phys ed, um, you know, coaching, you know, well, you could take that into sports, you could take it into training. Um, so that is when I was in the summer after that, I was lifeguarding, uh, typical, you know, 19, 18 years old. I wanted to get a tan and, and, uh, hang by a pool all day. So one of my lifeguard buddies that I was with that day said, uh, he, he volunteers with the special Olympics on Tuesday nights at the local YMCA. Um, he's like, dude, like you're motivational. Like you got energy. You like to help people. You love fitness. He's like, would you want to come over? We're all looking, you know, we're always looking for volunteers. So I said, sure. So I swung over on a Tuesday night. Um, and really kind of got hooked from, from the get-go. Um, you know, just giving my time for, for others that don't necessarily, um, you know, have, have the, you know, the, the, the ability just to just leave the house when they want. And these are people that, that a lot of them were in, you know, homes or, um, you know, where, where they needed to be transported to and from. So, so this was the, really their one hour for, for the week. And for me to be able to be there and help kind of coach them and guide them. Um, and, you know, I did that for, for a few months. And then uh, the head of the, um, powerlifting, the U.S. powerlifting team, Sean Hanley, he uh, reached out to me and said, look, he goes, you, you know, you're, you're working great with the guys, with the gals. He had started a company called Developmental Fitness. Um, we're specialized in working strictly with people with disabilities, both physical and mental. Um, and so I, from, from then on, uh, I, I was taking, you know, health and phys ed courses. Um, but ultimately, you know, he's like, you know, I, I went through the certification courses. I spent about six to nine months studying, got my certification exam um, through ACE Physical, or ACE, the American Council on Exercise, um, and started training. So, so for me, um, it was great, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I did that for about a year. Um, and then I think I, I just wanted a little bit more. It was, it was very specific, you know, I was, I was used to working a lot of in-home trainings, um, Down syndrome, autistic. It was great um, seeing, seeing the people I worked with and their families, how much it meant to them. It was awesome. Um, it's kind of something that I felt like I could do on my, my, my volunteer time, but I looked at ultimately what I wanted to do. And that was always, you know, going, going the next level, working with maybe athletes or, or waking, working with, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the nine to five business guy that's looking to get their, their life turned around. Um, and an opportunity came for me to pack up and move up to New Hampshire. Uh, I worked in Vermont. Um, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, her RA at college, had um, moved up there and he was a turf management major operating a run, helping run a golf course. And then the uh, facility they, that he was at needed a uh, health instructor for the, for the gym. So I applied, got the job, moved up there at 21 years old, was there for about a year. Um, and then kind of came back home. Um, being at a resort wasn't exactly ideal for keeping clients. There was a lot of people coming in for their weekends, their vacation home, trying to establish a clientele and keep them wasn't exactly the easiest. So I moved back home to Hatfield in Pennsylvania, um, applied at a, at, a, at a gym that was at the time, you know, one of the biggest gyms in the area, um, 10 to 15 trainers on staff. I got in, 
Um, you know, and I was 22, 23, I was young. I thought everybody I worked with was gonna be a miraculous success story. Um, it's when the biggest loser and all those shows were kind of coming. So, you know, people were thinking, oh, hundred pounds lost is kind of easy. And I thought everybody that works with me was gonna have this massive transformation. And it just wasn't the case. Um, you gotta be ready for stuff mentally. Um, you know, it's more than just showing up. And the one thing that it taught me um, kind of opened my eyes, you know, I was young, kind of naive, thought I knew everything already. But once I hit my mid twenties, late twenties is, is what fitness showed me was what it does mentally and what, it, what you know, you, you can't, you can't cheat health. You know, you, you can't, you can't get the health you want by taking shortcuts. You know, today's day and age with technology, everything we we're used to getting things we want when we want with very little wait period. Um, yeah. And you see it with the diets, you see it with the extreme dieting, you see it with all the infomercials that, that, that promise, you know, the, the, the stomach you want, the, the butt you want, everything um, with, you know, little to no effort because nobody's got time. Um, but so over the course of, um, you know, training, I then ran into, you know, a couple MMA guys. There was a martial arts academy in the gym I trained at and I had one of the instructors was a pro MMA fighter. For, he was having his first uh, pro fight. And he approached me about getting him conditioned. He's like, dude, I know jujitsu, boxing. I know all that. He goes, but my conditioning sucks. And I know that I need to get that in order. And he's like, I, I trust you with my health. He's like, I've seen you train. So um, he started work with me um, about eight weeks prior to his fight, got him in shape. He's like, when are you coming down to my domain? When are you going to come down here? And let me... So I made him like, this, you win your fight. You got me. I'll come down that, that next Monday. And he went out and he dominated. He won. So I took my... 200 pound, 205 pound, you know, meathead rear end down in the gym. And I proceeded to get my rear end handed to me by a 130 pound instructor. And uh, it was humbling. Um, and I think that's something that I think everybody needs, not necessarily to have your rear end kicked, but right. you know, to humble, to kind of pull you down a little bit. You know, I was 25, 26. Um, and so that got me into then doing the the MMA amateur wise for, for, for a few years, jujitsu. Um, and that to me was the overcoming the, the, the fear factor, which was, you know, getting punched in the face, all this and that. And then the fear of failure as well. Um, and I took that, my experiences with that. And then it also helped me grow as a person and then apply that to my personal training clients as well. You know, not everybody, everyone's obstacles, you know, you're out, not everyone's obstacle is going into a cage and getting into a, a fight. Um, it's not, you know, getting into a jujitsu match and getting submitted and you know, tapped out. Um, your obstacle could be at home. It could be your job. Um, things you don't necessarily want to face, but they're necessary um, in order to grow. You know, they've been telling, you know, all for, for how long, you know, growth starts outside your comfort zone. You know, we hear it all the time now, you know, if you stay in that kind of timid comfort zone, you don't grow there. You know, that's kind of where, you know, you're like a like, like, like bread that's left too long and it's in the, in the you know, eventually it's going to grow mold. It's going to go old. It's going to go stale. Um, so constantly stepping outside of that. And then applying that, like I said, to clients, we're just getting them outside of their comfort zone. Um, you know, what if I if I let every client that trains with me say, "Give me four exercises you want to do," they'd pick the same four because they're the, usually the easier ones. Um, it's when I do the exercises that they always say, "You know, you know, I hate this. I hate this. Sucks." They, yeah. Well, that's why you're doing it. You know, because this is the shit that's gonna suck. This is the stuff that's. But this is what's gonna. You know, when you leave here, you're you're gonna feel ten times better. And then next time when I have you do it, you know, you did it once, you can do it a second time. And the more you do things, the less scary they get. Um, the fear of failure goes away. But in the gym, I tell people, I'm like, if you don't like failure, then the gym's not the place for you because you're going to fail every day. Um, you're going to do something. You're going to push yourself to the point where failure is the only option. Um, but through there, that's where the, that's where the growth comes. Um, and so the connection between mind and body, um, as I've gotten older, you know, now being in the industry for, you know, almost you know, 18, 19, 20 years, um, just to see how closely connected the mind and body are. And I've seen people with great physical attributes, feats that can do the best, but, but the smallest things outside their comfort zone, yeah. cripple them. Um, and then I've seen people that aren't that physically gifted, aren't that strong, that just have mental strength where they can, they'll, they'll, they'll push and they'll give it all they got. Um, but it's usually those that are the most naturally you know they always say the naturals the naturals well the naturals don't have to really develop the mind i think until later um because for the first you know i've trained guys that were that went on to become pro fighters in the beginning it was always easy they were tapping everybody out they were but as the competition grows those guys are now working harder you know your competitors are now working harder um and if your work ethic doesn't match that 
you can be good, but you know, can you be very good? Can you be great? And that applies, like I said, not just to, to fighters, but just can you be a great right. father? Can you be a great spouse, whatever. So um, just that the correlation of the mind and body is really ultimately what, what I've seen kind of transpire or over my personal growth as well, that I can take all the stuff that I've seen, the hardships other people have had to overcome and things that I did through volunteering um, and know that, okay, it, it's okay to get people a little uncomfortable and get them into their, um, you know, to, to show them that you can overcome this one step at a time and ultimately be, be better for it. So it's one of the things there was the, um, his name is Patton Oswalt. He was, I don't know if you remember the show King of Queens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was Spence on King of Queens. Yep, I remember him. Meeting. He does, he has some really um, genius stuff. But one of the things that he talks about is embracing the suck. Yep. Embrace the suck. It's okay to be uncomfortable. And for me, I know when we first met, I talked about this. At this time last year, I was just a shell of my former self. I was a former college athlete. I played baseball in college. I coached, I taught, and I was an administrator. But it, slowly but surely, it was like a kind of erosion. I let myself get into this really just comfortable spot in life where I was just kind of going through the motions and there was nothing that was challenging me. Yep. And I did this 30-day boot camp. And it was more just, it, I just needed that spark, that catalyst. And I look at where I was. It was right around this time last year to where I am now. And the biggest mind shift that I made was embracing discomfort, being comfortable in that uncomfortable spot. That's where growth happens. It's really easy to stay in that, like between the lines, you have to step outside and yeah, yeah. yourself and then see what you're capable of. Cause yep. I'm like, damn, I could fucking do this shit. I'm proud of myself. Yep. Right now. I mean, it's easy. Like I said, I'm like, it's, it's, it's still, like you said, stepping across that line, it's, it's, it's one step, you know, it's, it's 1%. It's just doing one thing. And like you said, where you're at today versus where you were a year ago, or a year ago, I had a client today, I was talking with the same thing, you know, he's like the 1% rule, you know, it, but they compound habits compound themselves. And one of the best uh, quotes, I'm not sure, you know, where, where, who, who said it, but it was, you know, if you have two boats that are sailing, you know, side by side and identical paths, boat on the left turns just one degree to the left. In one day, that's a minuscule change, but in 365 days, the distance between those two boats would be monumental. But they all, but all it was, was it was one degree. The problem is, is nobody wants the 365 one degree. They want 60 degrees in a weekend and then 20 degree. It's, it's how can I do this in that little time? And, and I tell people all the time, and, and it's true, the older you get, the, slow, the, the faster time goes. You know, so if I got a lot of younger, you know, especially I get a lot of high school, college kids, you know, they want it, they want it now. And I'm like, the year is going to pass regardless. So why not commit to the, commit, commit to doing it this way, you know, do it where it's sustainable. You know, you're not going to burn yourself out. Um, but that's them also, like you said, accepting and, and embracing the, the suck. I tell people all the time, like get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, you know, and then there, there, there's days to be comfortable. You know, I call it, you know, the, the zombie workouts where, you know, there's days I'm sure you've had it where you just, you feel like shit. You don't want to do it, but you know, you need it. And I go, those are the days where are you a hundred percent? No. Are you 80? No. Are you 70%? No. I don't give a shit if you're, I tell clients, if you're 2%, if you're, you know, you're, you're, if your iPhone has that red dot that says there's 1% left, you got one, you still have 1%. Still juice. So you're dead and that shuts yeah. off get your ass going. And there's, there's days to zombie walk through a workout where you just go through the motions. But I think a lot of times people get stuck just going through the motions. Like you said, because we are in this area of comfort where, okay, it's starting to get too hard. I'm going to back off now and trying to overcome that. It's, it's hard trying to instill it in others is equally hard. Um, but it's ultimately like chatting with you. It's, it's surrounding yourself with like-minded people. Um, and a lot of times you'll notice if people are that are afraid to step out of their comfort zone, it's not just them. It's, it's, it's who their network is and it's who's around them. Um, you know, above average people don't settle for, for staying in the average space. And so, you know, the, the average person's not going to push me. Um, it's the above average person, the above average mindset, um, and, and, and going out and doing things like a, like an interviewer doing you know, networking with other people, um, it, that, that that's where you ultimately see growth throw around ideas and uh you know not, not just being okay with being stagnant so and i think that you hit the nail on the head there i think you're the kind of um the mean the average of the five people that you spend the most most time with yep. either in person or even intellectually like trying to learn from people every single day it might be someone who's just a little bit better than you in whatever area maybe it's public speaking maybe it's 
you know, business sense, it could be physical fitness wise, but finding that one person or a couple of people and like always trying to just raise your game a little bit. Conversely, you know, people are stuck in this mindset where they they're with the same group of people for the last 20 years. They're out drinking on Friday nights and yep. all over on Saturday morning. And to the point about the workouts, I mean, it, you know, outside of being injured, there's never been a workout in my life or training session in my life that I regretted. Even no. if, if you have that 1% juice left, you fucking no. get there and you do it. And at the end of it, you're, it might not have been the best experience, but you know what? I fucking just did that. Yep. I'm done with it now. I feel better about myself moving forward. Yep. I have, I, and I, I deal with it daily, especially the early morning. You know, I, the, the 5 a.m. classes, the 5, 5 a.m. trainings, I get people all the time every day that walk in to say, I don't want to do this shit. And I said, they, I, I feel like shit. I don't want to be here. I go, talk to me in an hour. Just talk to me in an yeah. hour. And whenever they leave, I said, 60 minutes ago, you walked in there, you felt like absolute dog shit, but you got in the door. And that's the hardest part is getting out of bed, getting in the door. I said, how do you feel now? No one, like you said, 100% of the time, everyone says, I, I feel better. I feel awake. You know, movement has been studied. Even just a five minute walk has been shown just to what it can do to uplift the mood. Um, and springboards are great. Absolutely. Know, and, that, and that's where I tell people all the time, getting up, you know, I, I, I stress the importance of, of the morning routine. Um, but I also know that, that that works for me. I got clients who do night routines, you know, that for me, the best time I say, it doesn't matter when your routine is, you need to, you need to establish one. Um, and whether that's when the kids go to bed or whether that's when your, you know, your, your spouse is working, if she works later, or if your husband works later, whatever it may be, find a time, not find a time. I hate that term. I make the time, make a time where, you know, everybody's got 20 minutes. You know, we, we, we say we don't, but if we, we looked at how much time we spend on screen time, um, how much time you know, on the weekends, we, you know, binge watching, you know, going out with friends, all this and that. I'm like, I'm asking for 15 minutes a day for yourself you know, you owe it to yourself for that 15 minutes. Um, but being comfortable is ultimately like goes back to the, to the comfort thing. And what you said about seeking out other people and, and being the average of the five people, um, you know, and I, I, I add to that with, you know, the whole, the, the diet terminology where you're, you know, your diet's more than just what you eat. It's what you see, it's what you hear. Yeah. And when you said seeking out people that are better than you, that, that struck a chord. Cause when I was younger, that takes that takes humility to to you know as a younger trainer as I, to say that I'm you know I think my way is the best but to sit there and say going to someone that you think it it requires keeping your ego in check and ego is what kills most 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 goals from really getting achieved because people think I want to do it on my terms and I hear it all the time people that say, I, I really want to get training with you but I'm just not ready I want to I want to come and I'm, I'm like you're 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 never going to be ready. You know, it's, it's like saying, well, instead of going to flight school, learn to fly a plane, I'm just going to get behind and I'm just going to start. Let me just, let me just try the, 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 the instruments and figure it out. It's like, well, no, but that you may be able to, but guidance, you know, you're going to eliminate so many other errors. Seek out the professionals, you know, you know, go find that guidance. But that takes a lot of humility and it admits that I don't know as much as I think I know. And there's always someone and they say, no matter who you meet, treat that person like you can learn something from them, you know, the person on the street, you know, asking for money, you know, talk to them. You can literally learn from everybody. Um, but we have this faulty thinking as if, you know, this person, this demographic, this, whatever, you know, I, well, I can't know, they're not going to know more than me. So I got to go seek out somebody that's, that's, you know, up, up, up here. Well, the janitor sweeping up the floors at, at the, the, the grocery store could give you great financial advice. You just don't fucking know it. And, it's uh like I said, but it but it requires that humility and that ego, but it also requires you of of, of rebranding your network and who are those five people you're spending time with, you know. And I say, you know, they, you know, if, you know, if you're trying to build a fire, you know, are those people are they little guys, you know, are they people throwing logs on the fire or are they people that are that are they're pissing on it, you know? So it's, are they helping you grow to your goal or are they more or less, you know, you're having fun with them and they're keeping you kind of back. And for a lot of people, you could be that friend. I mean, I could be that friend for some people. You know, I'm humble enough to know that, you know, I might not be the best uh, for, for what other people's goals are. Yeah. I could be either too aggressive. I could be certain type. You know, that's why I tell people there's there's not one good trainer. You know, people tell me, well, you know, maybe maybe check out on a trainer. I said, go, go test out trainers. You know, you don't know what car you want until you drive it. I said, you might not be, I might not be a good fit for everybody. You might, but you might have more success with somebody else, but you know, go get variety, but, but, but expand who you're hanging out with um, and expand who you're spending the most time with. So your point about 
fully investing in conversations that really struck a chord with me. I just did an interview with my younger brother, who's actually in the same space as you are. Mm -hmm. um, he's a physical trainer. He works at the Solberry School. And our conversations, uh, it really centered around depression, anxiety. He had social anxiety from a very young age. Whenever he had an opportunity to speak in public, it really could be crippling for him. Mm -hmm. So one way that he steps out of it, his comfort zone every day is just to try to talk to someone new. And he's such an engaging human being. You wouldn't look at him and think, this guy really struggles with mental health and depression and anxiety, but he does. Mm -hmm. So he tries to talk to someone new every day, but what he's really good at is being empathic. He can, when he's talking to you, everything else in the world shuts down. I think so many people right now go into a conversation just to give information. I'm going to talk mm -hmm. to you and tell you what I know about shit. Yep. And even when someone's talking, I see it all the time in my profession, you know, working with teachers around social, most um, social emotional learning. I see people there, they're not really engaged in the conversation. They're just waiting for the silence to happen. So yep. they interject their point. So this way, you know what they know. Oh, yeah. So it really hit, struck a chord with me going into, and there, every person in the world has something to offer. So it's just investing yeah. in those conversations and speaking with people, getting to learn a little bit more about them. Yep, for sure. I, um, I like after you went through your journey and you kind of like let us know where you kind of came from along the way, I just had a lot of just follow-up things I was thinking. One, um, I'm curious what sports you played. You mentioned you were an athlete, you played sports in, in high school. Um, what were the sports that you played and what, maybe what's a lesson that you might've learned from those sports that you took into your future and your career? So, I mean, I, I grew up, I went to a private school. We didn't have football. We didn't have wrestling. We had none of the physical sports. Um, we had soccer, we had baseball, we had basketball. For me, soccer, baseball were the two primary. I dabbled in basketball. I can't dribble worth shit. And I didn't care enough to practice at that time. I, you know, I, anybody can learn anything at that time. It wasn't, wasn't my thing. Um, soccer and baseball were the number one baseball ultimately, you know, over, over ruled soccer. I was just, I loved it. And I, I, I slept it, eat it, breathed it, whatever. And I, when, I, when we weren't practicing, I was looking for buddies to go, to go to the field and, and take, take crown balls and stuff like that. Um, so that the, the the team concept is what kind of really that, which I think, you know, with, especially with youth sports and having two little kids that are now getting into it now is seeing just the, the importance of teamwork, um, you know, and teaching them that, you know, it, 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 it takes, a, it takes a village, just like, you know, it takes a team, you know, you look at a team sport, um, you know, every, it takes everybody doing their part. Um, you can have some people that do, you know, that, that Excel, you know, I, I, we played in, I'm sure anybody that's played sports knows we all had baseball teams where we had, really shitty teams we played but they had maybe one really good player well that one really good player isn't going to carry the other nine or the other eight um and but and that's where it takes you know we had a, a a baseball team in high school um and we i think we had 12 guys on our varsity team we had three subs um we didn't have a big team there was a bunch of just gritty kind of hard working guys and, and we went on to win districts uh two years in a row i was there with the state uh, state title or um state playoffs we were we were, you know, I went away from going to the state championship game. We played against a kid that was already drafted by the Orioles. He threw 90 some miles an hour, blah, 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 blah. And we hung in there, you know, and when we played with them. Um, but ultimately the, the, the sports, when we go back into, go back to jujitsu MMA, I, I, I'd never played an individual sport. Um, so if, if my team lost, the blame got, you know, dispersed. Right hey, you know, well, yeah, I didn't do my part. Well, neither did Kyle, you know, like, you know, yeah, there's yeah. always that, which keeps you, keeps your ego because you don't want to feel like you did. Whereas when I got into jujitsu and I remember, you know, I, I, I did my first jujitsu, my first grappling tournament, um, scared the crap out of me. I'm sitting here going like, okay, I'm going to go out, grapple with, with this opponent and like, it's on me. Like I lose, I don't have anybody else to blame. I got the spotlight on me. Um, you know, and it was, it was a tournament. I, I, I won my first match, got instantly crushed my second to the guy that ended up winning. But then MMA came around and that was the same thing. That was just more intense. You know, grappling was submissions. There's no striking. Um, but once we got into the MMA, it was a cray crap. I had never been in a fight in my life. I grew up like I always ran from, if there was ever a, you know, crap going on, I was like, ah, I don't want to get involved. Yeah. Um, so I remember when they asked me, hey, there's, there's a fight going on on August, uh, I think it was August 8th back in 2009 or 2008. And uh, my coach called me and said, hey, they're putting together a card. Do you want to fight? And I was on the couch with my, with my wife and I said, no. I said, no, no. I said, yeah, no, no. And I remember hanging up and I told Natalie, my wife, 
you know, was rich. He was calling for this and that. And about, well, I don't think it was an hour. It just, it festered in me. I go like you little bitch, like, like <laughs> just like my fear kept me. Yeah. I, I said, no, not because I, I doubted my, 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 my training and like that. I was afraid of having my ass kicked and I was afraid of getting embarrassed and I was afraid of losing. That was period. Like that was it. There was no other reason. Um, and less than an hour later, I got the phone. I called him back and I said, throw me on, let's do it. And, uh, no, I, I, I had the fight. It was, uh, I remember being backstage. I don't know. I was the eighth or ninth fight. And it was, uh, you know, I'm watching the guys ahead of me go out, get banged up, come backstage. And I just remember sitting there going like, shit, like what in the world did I get myself into? I did not want to go out at all. I probably had 50 plus family and friends who bought tickets that were out there. So I, they were, all I remember was turning and there was an exit sign. There was a door behind me. And I just thought, if there was ever a time just just leave and get out of here this was it but uh no I, I i sucked it up i went out and uh in the third round you know i dominated the guy conditioning uh, cardiovascular wise i was taking him down and then the you know my coach told me in the corner between the second and third round he just said ryan he's gassed he's got nothing left every time you shoot on him you're taking him down at will fake fake a shot throw an overhand right and then i hadn't been boxing nearly i said well what's the overhand right he said just fake a shot throw a right punch it okay and i did i came out and faked a shot overhand right and it was like this all the years playing baseball it's like hitting the sweet spot of the bat you don't feel it um i knew i hit him i seen him go down and then i seen his arms and legs in the air and his eyes rolled knocked him out cold that was it fight over it was the only knockout of the night i went ballistic bat shit career i thought it was the coolest thing in the world um but then it taught me that night. I mean, I was, I was on cloud nine, you know, and I, but then I went back to four months prior when I got the call. And I remember I said this, this overcoming all of this, this feeling of, of, um, you know, proudness of myself, like you were afraid, you said, no, you, you reassessed, you said, get your shit together. What do you got to lose? And I, and I committed to it. And now I'm here and I go, I would never have this feeling had I, had I, stayed in my lane, stayed in my comfort zone. Um, but, but stepping out of that allowed me to feel that. And uh, it was great. And I took another fight maybe a month later and that one I lost in two minutes. And the guy choked me out in two minutes. And so that was also another, okay, I had the highest of the high and now I just got my ass kicked lowest to low. And I ended up having one more amateur fight Won that I was two and one. And that was right around the time that I was, uh, getting ready to leave the gym I was at in order to get out and start my own, my, my own business. So um, that's kind of when I, when I wrapped it up and just said, it was an amateur career. It was two and one. I did a bunch of jujitsu tournaments. Um, but just those few years of that type of training taught me more in those two years than all the years of the team sports. I mean, team, team sports are great for, you know, for even for business. I mean, like we're working as a team, whether you're in the corporate world or what, um, what, what I do now with being my own you know, self-employed, doing the one on, you know, doing, doing the MMA and the jujitsu where it's just me and I'm taking on the responsibility and I own my successes, but I better damn well own my failures. Um, kind of got me ready, I think, to, to step outside of the comfort confines of being in an established gym and going out into, into opening up my own place where there's nothing guaranteed. So, so I mean, one, you're you're two for three in your career two and one i mean that 666 gets in the hall of fame in most right, well you know there's no <laughs> hall of fame for amateurs but i'll take it so. <laughs> so i mean i'm so curious about that right so there were two moments there one you got the call from rich and you're on the couch and you're like nah i'm not gonna do it you talk to your wife you look at her that's one moment where that hour time frame went by and the second is as the other fights are going through you were the eighth or ninth fight and you're sitting there you see the x and sign what was it that kept you in that made you not you know that made you call rich back and be like fuck it i'm in and the other part not running out the door and being like I, i'm not into this so what what was it inside of you was there was it a life lesson that you learned is that just your your dna coding you were born with this like yeah, I'm not gonna definitely not i mean definitely not dna i i mean I've, I've been a runner i ran my entire you know I, I i had older kids in the neighborhood that 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 you know would want to play football with me bigger than me i ended up getting my ass kicked 90 percent of the time so I was used to getting kind of picked on, beat up, but I also, I never fought back. Never. I mean, my whole, I was always, you know, when I grew up in a private schools, you know, to be non-confrontational, we don't do that. 
And so for me, I was taught, well, you don't fight. And when problems arise, if it's, if you can't settle it with words, then you walk away. And I think I kind of felt this culmination of, you know, I was, I was 20, you know, I don't know what I was then probably 26 years old. And I'm kind of sitting there like, all right, every time in my life that something's gotten hard or something's gotten scary, I've been able to have an exit. I've been able to just kind of, I'll just go over here. But with this, it was, it was just me. Um, and I think I remember, and you know, and I had, I had three other teammates that I, that I trained with that, that were fighting as well that night. And I watched, you know, three of them go out and fight guys that I had trained with guys that I knew I could compete with yeah. guys that, so I, I said, and I, and I also had teammates that loved getting punched in the face. Like they were those guys that you see getting punched and they're just, it makes them more happy. They get energized. It's crazy. And I go, I was never like that. Like, guys that it just welcome getting punched and I I was always the opposite where I was just if I could avoid it all costs but like you said at that time it was a it was a fight or flight moment and I said dude you're like you're you're 26 years old like really like it's amateur MMA you're not gonna die here hopefully you know I signed a shitload of waivers so maybe but at the same time like just do it you know stop shut off that little voice in your brain that's constantly telling you to to you know it's okay to walk away. And I finally just said, fuck it. And, and faced up to it, went out there. And, and when I did go out, there was, there was a calming presence. I think you're kind of in the moment. Um, and, you know, once you kind of, once I was forced to stop thinking and just react, um, it was fine. And, and that's, and that's where I see it with clients, even in the gym, I can tell when the mental wheels start going in the head, when they're doing an exercise that they may have failed at the, pre and they're, they're, they're stagnant. They're not starting. And I go, let's go. And I'm like, you're, you're thinking, like, stop thinking, thinking will get you in trouble. Like thinking, it, th thinking your, your mind can be your biggest, you know, supporter, but for mo for a lot of people, depending on mindset makeup, your mind is your biggest detractor. I mean, nobody harshly evaluates us like us. I mean, everybody has their problem areas with their body. Everybody has their problem areas uh, with their home life, things that they know that a lot of people probably don't see. Um, like you stated with your brother, like anxiety, like I, I didn't, I, I don't do social speaking well. I don't do the interview part well. Um, but over time, it's just, it's, it's, it's stepping outside that comfort zone. The more you do it, you get done and you go, was it so bad? No, it wasn't. So um, I just think once you do it once, you got to keep doing it again and keep doing it again and again and again and again and again. And eventually you go, okay, it builds that history of, I've done it before. I know I can do it. Maybe not in this particular part of my life, but it's, but it, but it really does spread to, to all aspects of your life. I mean, fear, you know, if, if there's no fear involved, at least in my mind, the bar is never set that high, you know, cause, cause fear usually is fear of failure. And if there's no fear of failure, if, if, if failure is not an option in, in your goal, then I'm like, then you need to reassess your goals and move that bar a little higher. So. It's so interesting. You mentioned mindset. I, I'm a firm believer in we would never treat people that we care about the way that we treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. People we don't care about. We would yeah. never, the way that we think about ourselves and our Absolutely. Mindset. So it's, it's, you know, having that healthy self-talk. It was so interesting. You said there was like this moment of calm as you were, as you entered, you know, the, the cage to fight. And you, and I believe it goes back to, you know, being a former athlete and, and training, you, you go back on your training. Like you, mm -hmm you kind of default to whenever the there's this high pressure type situation. If you're properly trained in that way, in that aspect, you'll fall back on your training all the time. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it took you four months to get to that point, you had been training and then you took another four months, you entered that situation. You're like, okay, I feel this kind of calmness come about me. And that's why you were probably able to perform. If you just came in off the streets, obviously it's a totally different right, so you right. back on your training and you can kind of go back and kind of, you know, it's a, you know, as your, your body remembers going through the situation, so you can kind of tone everything else down. It's like being in the zone for an athlete, you know, when you think about Jordan and, and, you know, Brady and all these, they, they kind of get to that spot in their mind where they're able to just kind of quiet all the noise and just go yep. back to, the, to their training. Yep. Well, for sure. So, I mean, there were so many other things you brought up. I mean, one, I just, I picture you as a lifeguard. Where, where did you lifeguard? I was in an apartment complex. It was not the. Uh, oh, it wasn't you weren't Dave, David Hasselhoff. On no, the, they didn't know. Well, the right. company was going to put me. They had a lot of different nice pools that I thought yeah. maybe I'll get put here. Uh, maybe like a community pool, like a big one. Um, and then they said, "Oh, we're going to stick you over." And there was a small 
a small village apartment complex and uh they told me that's where i would be and i was like i they have a pool like, i didn't even know they had a pool right. in that place. uh and i got in there and it was uh it was intense it was not the summer i imagined uh the it wasn't the, the setting i imagined but i mean ultimately going back to the beginning ultimately i mean this dude arthur i met i met the other lifeguard arthur there and he's the dude that that, that hooked me up with getting into the Special Olympics yeah. volunteering. So had I not been placed there, you know, on, on, if you take it face value where I ended up, I looked at it and I go, I don't want to be here. But being there is ultimately, you know, would I have found this down the road? I believe I probably would have, but ultimately being there hooked me up with Arthur. Arthur hooked me up with getting into Special Olympics, hooked me up with, you know, Sean and, and so on and so on. So that kind of put the, the wheels in motion and, you know, and it kind of you know goes back to, to to the mindset and looking for the looking for the silver lining and everything you know I, and i like you said there's everybody can offer something some form of helpful conversation no matter who they are just like every situation i feel you know if if, if, if you're always looking at the negatives you're going to find negatives in anything if you look hard enough um but you know the hardest part is looking at a time that may have caused you pain in the moment um and then being able to reflect back on that maybe months years later and say, you know, usually that light goes on, like, you know what, like, this is where it started. But like, if I could erase that part, well, if you erase that part, you got to look at how it affected the next five months, five years. Um, and a lot of things fell into place because of those hurdles you came over. Um, but no, I mean, I look back at that. Yeah, the, the, the lifeguarding was definitely it was a short lived one season career. Um, a that the pay, they don't pay that well but it was uh it, it was fine but yeah no it was uh but that ultimately like i said it, it got me introduced to the, to the people that ultimately helped put me in the direction that i'm on now so even though it wasn't what you thought you were in that spot in your life at the time you needed to be there for this specific reason and it got you to where you were and your idea about you know looking for the negative things in your life i've, I've said it on previous podcasts if, if i told you right now to to look around the room and, and find everything that's red in the room and and you know concentrate on everything that's red close your eyes and tell me everything that's green. You know what I mean? Like if you're exactly. searching for those red things, yep. you can see them. Yep. You yep. know? So if I'm searching for only negative things, you'll find negative yep. shit. Yep. Conversely, if I say look for every positive in your life right now, you'll find those things and it will um, confirm that belief that things are going to happen in the way that they're supposed to happen when they're supposed to happen. For sure. For sure. Definitely. With the, with the Special Olympics, I mean, you're, you're working with, I, as a former, you know, educator and principal, those relationships that I um, made with students with special needs were some of the most rewarding relationships in my life. I think back to um, a student, as a fifth grade student, he came to my middle school with Down syndrome. Um, he had a really challenging time communicating. And we did this advisory program in my school where the students would have to, it was every morning, it was around community building practices. They would greet each other. There was a sharing component. There was an activity. And what I really wanted to do was, especially in middle school, have, have opportunities for kids to bond together, to understand there were less things that made them different um, while right. we wanted to celebrate their uniqueness, them to understand like, just because they're going through middle school, like we're going through a lot of these similar things together. So there was this, this boy who had Down syndrome who really had a difficult time communicating. And I just love this kid. And he was a part of the Building Men program when I ran it as a middle school principal. He didn't really, you know, communicate all that much but he was a part of it and he took right. a lot of it in when he was in eighth grade he led a advisory meeting with 22 other eighth grade students and he ran them through a greeting some kind of a share and activity and I remember his mom calling me up and telling me she was in tears she didn't think he was going to be able to even go to this school that they would have to send him to a, a specialized school and for him to be with his peers and being able to communicate in that way it was such I mean it was one of the most rewarding experience for my life just seeing how a student with special needs was impacted. So for you working with, with, you know, athletes that were in the special Olympics, you know, was there a lesson that you learned from that experience that you were like, Oh my God, what do I have to complain about? Or look at, look at the way that these, these young men and young men, women were able to overcome some kind of adversity in their life. Was there a lesson that you really took from that experience? I mean, it, it was, it made me also not take for granted. I mean, cause we had, you know, able-bodied and we had, you know, disabled bodies, you know, um, legs missing, arm missing, um, you know, wheelchair bound, you know, but, and, and a lot of the kids I worked with um, and the individuals I worked with were, were, were just had, you know, born that way. It wasn't like they were able-bodied, but from day one, they've been handed 
you know, what an able body, you know, someone like me would look at someone, you know, when, when you're younger, you see somebody in, in a wheelchair, can't use their legs and you think, oh man, that must suck. But to see them go on to just w- what they were able to accomplish in the gym, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the competitions. And never once was it a, well, I could be better if I could, like, they, they didn't in their mind. And, and you, to see them like, you you get you get used to what you're used to and so if you're used to having one arm eventually you know someone that's born with two arms two legs can't imagine how somebody that loses both arms would go about you know going on and and then and then thriving in life but but it but it happens and and the human body is capable of adapting um but the the number one thing i always took away was there was never there was never the sense of the victim what was me um I wish this, I wish that none of them ever wished for anything to be different about them. It was always coach Ryan. Hey, let's today, I'm going to lift this. And then tomorrow we're going to do this. And then we're, and it was just this constant and the camaraderie, you know, at the end of every, at the end of every Tuesday night, we did a bench off, you know, and we'd have everybody, we'd, we'd have the PRs marked from the, from the previous week. And we'd have 12, 15 athletes in there and they'd be, you know, one at a time would go and the other 12 to 13 would surround them as he's go as they're going for their PR and they'd be climbing, just going nuts. Like, like you're at a sporting event cheering on your best team and just seeing these, the, 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 the uniqueness of the community where it was all about each other. You know, there was not, there was no ego whatsoever. Um, we didn't have anybody. Now you very nothing. It's like, well, I left more than you and they'll, they'll bust each other's you know stones that way. But for the most part, there was never any jealousy. There was never any, um, you know, uh, being being hostile or towards somebody because they lifted more weight than you. It was a matter of you just better last week high five and then everybody went around and high fived each other. And for me, that was just it was very it was very calming, you know. And it, and it took away that this only you know the, the more we work together and the more you stay you, you you build each other up and that goes back like the five people you spend time with. And these yeah. are people that they came together multiple times a week to do this. And this was then in my eyes in their best, the best environment, you know, and that's what's, what's healthier than, 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 than health. I mean, you know, when, when, when you're healthy and you're motivating others um, you know, you can take a lot of your physical accomplishments and you can use that as a catalyst to get to, to, to help with business, to help with your, your, your mental makeup, to help with, you know, strengthening and growing your mind. Um, and, and so that, that was probably the number one thing I took away was just the sense of, no bitching, no complaining, um, no woe is me. You know, there were every, everybody had their everybody had what they were you know quoted as being deficient in, but you never heard it out of their mouth uttered one time that well this is this this makes me different or this makes me not be able to do it as well. So it's it's so interesting, and I think just being in the moment, like I think of that that camaraderie and that team feel as people are trying to pump each other up. I, as a coach, I would often, especially before a big game, I would like gather boys over. I coach baseball and I coach basketball, the two sports that I played in high school. And um, I remember before the championship basketball game, I brought the kids over. I actually gave them the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. It's my favorite poem of all time. My son is looking at me like, dad, are you fucking kidding me right now? You're going to give us a poem before the championship game? And I'm like, just read it. And I yeah. <laughs> read on the last stanza. And it was, if you, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man. My son is the mm-hmm. last stanza of that poem, which I just, I love that. Yeah. And I told him, I'm like, listen, you're whatever grade, you're eighth grade, you're ninth grade. You're going into this championship basketball game. I'm like, I would give my left nut to be in a position right now to compete yeah. for a championship. I'm like, go out there. Don't be nervous. Enjoy this situation. Like take it in, love this moment. Enjoy yep. it. Because once it's gone, it's gone and yeah. in that moment. So, I mean, I think about the community feel, but I also think about just like just embracing that moment and then experiencing again as an athlete. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I also no, think, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, you go ahead. I, uh, I think back to when you were talking about PRs. Um, it's a funny story. I, I was going to ask you about, just like, you know, I'm sure you've seen embarrassing moments in the gym or experiencing, experiencing them yourself. So there was one time I was lifting with my son. I want to say it was about two years ago. And I was trying to get, I had done my personal record. I was able to get um, three plates, the 315. And I wanted to get back up to it. So I was like, I wanted, I wanted to bench 300 at the gym um, that day to be able to get back up to my, you know, to, to get a PR. And so my son is, is spotting me. 
and this is, he's probably in seventh grade or eighth grade at the time. Now he's a sophomore. And so just him spotting was going to be a little tricky as I was trying to get 300. Um, and as I'm building up to it, I remember I had whatever I had 275 on. So it was like two, you know, two plates and then a 25 on each side. And I'm like, all right, then we're going to put whatever on. And he did, he forgot to take off one of the plates before he put the other weight on or something. And I go to, I go to pick it up and I don't have any clips on. Thank God. I go to pick it up and one side had on like 315, the other side had on 275 and the weight just fell yeah, like this. Yeah. Like all the plates fell off one side and yeah. it looked like this and all fell on the other side. And at the gym, everybody turns around like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, everyone, now, all the yep. plates are on the ground. I'm embarrassed. Like, I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. But that was one of those moments where I was, oh, yeah. it was my fault for not checking on it, but it was yep. one of those moments. Everybody, everybody's been there. No, yep. I've, I, I've been, I've been stuck under a barbell on an incline press as a trainer. And I had to, you know, I was on incline. So my legs were, my hips were up and then yeah. the barbell had nowhere, a flat bench. Everyone's been stuck under it. You got to do, you know, you got to roll the bar down. Uh, I did it on an incline and I couldn't, I got it down to my waist, but because my legs were up, I couldn't sit up. So I had to call over. It was a lunch hour. There's maybe three of the people at the hour working out. And I just know a little help, a little help. A couple of them came over and here I was the trainer stuck underneath, you know, right. this, this, this incline weight. And now, I mean, like I said, you, you work in a gym long enough, you work out long enough, you're going to see some, some, some crazy shit, some dumb yeah. shit, some people that make you scratch your head and go like, what the hell are you doing? But right. You know, I, I, I try and not pass judgment at gyms. I go, look, everybody's here for the same thing. We're all here to try to get healthier. We're all here to try to get stronger. We're all here to try to get better. That some people just need a little extra guidance. You know, this, this, this could be this person's first day here. Right. And if you laugh at them or give them shit, like odds are they hated the gym before today. Now they're really going to hate it and they're not going to come back. So, but oh yeah, but for sure there is the, uh, there's the, there's the gym fails. I get some, my clients send me gym fail videos all the time. It should happen in the gym. It's always worth the laugh, but yeah. So you mentioned before the idea where when you were younger, you were, you were the one to kind of run away from those challenging situations. Then that turned into you actually being in an amateur or three amateur MMA fights. And I think about masculinity a lot. And, you know, a lot of what I do with building men is just trying to discover what masculinity means. And so you know, even the idea of like aggressiveness and, and as, you know, I was kind of in the same way growing up, I was kind of told you need to, you know, stand up for yourself in this now, but my nature was always to avoid conflicts, you know, yep. if I could to avoid conflicts to get myself into a kind of a safe spot. I had been in some fights growing up um, at a young age. I was at the bad end of bullying where I was kind of, I got my ass kicked a couple of times, but mm -hmm. um it was one of those things where I was always trying to keep the peace if I could, and it made right. me uncomfortable. So you have, you have two boys, right? Yep. Two so, little ones. To, and so you're, you're, you know, as a, as a father, as their role model, when you think about masculinity, what are certain things that you want to make sure that they go through their elementary, middle school, high school experience, where if they look back and they say, my dad really taught me this about masculinity, what would that be? There's a, there's a few things. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's work ethic, not that that doesn't apply to all. Um, but, you know, I, we're not that far removed where, you know, the man of the house was, was, did the work, you know, and then, you know, my mom, she, she would raise the, she raised all the kids, which having had kids and staying home with kids, you know, staying home with children is not, is not a, you know, vacation. It's, right. you know, people hear, oh, you're a stay home parent, you're a stay home mom. And they think it's, you know, a seven day vacation week all the time. Um, but it was, you know, it was the hard work ethic, but also doing things when you're tired, you know, getting, getting, getting kind of comfortable being uncomfortable, but also, you know, standing up for what's right, whether that's the kid that's getting, you know, picked on at school. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the kind of the masculine rite of passage is, you know, to the aggressiveness, you know, boys and girls are, they're inherently different. You know, I got, I got a bunch of nieces and I got two sons of my own. Um, the way they play is just, it's different. Boys are more physical. Um, I think they need that outlet. Um, you know, the, the, the physical, you know, back in Roman times, they'd have them out. Not that we need to have kids sword fighting for practice, but you know, that was kind of learning how to get your knuckles dirty, learning how to get your knees cut up. Um, but also, you know, like having the principles of, of hard work, but also respecting, you know, women, respecting your elders. Um, you know, if you're going, I tell boys even now, I mean, they're seven years old, you know, if we're going into a store and if you see there's, you know, a, an older woman or an older lady or an older man, you know, 
going in a little slower, you hold the door and you wait for them to go first. Or if you see a, a lady walking in or somebody with a little child, like do, doing the things that have always been looked at as being just a gentleman. Um, but, but as far as, you know, masculinity, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's not being afraid to get your hands dirty, knuckles dirty, um, and then confronting maybe the bully when you need to. You know, I was, like you said, I had the same exact kind of advice you were given. It was avoid it at all costs if you can. But at the same time, I was never really taught hit back if you need to. But that's one thing I'm teaching my kids is I don't encourage, I don't encourage fighting. I don't encourage punching people for no good reason. However, you know, if name calling all that, I say, well, then let your teacher know, let, let me know. The minute somebody, you know, if, and if the kid, if you tell them to stop five times and they put their hands on you, by all means, do what you got to do. And, 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 and to me, that's just, um, it's not trying to be ego or macho. It's, it's, you know, you have to defend yourself and, and, and boys, like we talked about, whether it's, whether it's somebody with special needs, whether it's a girl, whether it's a, whether it's a, a, an undersized, you know, another other, like an undersized boy, that's the easy target. Um, you know, I, I had kids that were smaller, they were always picked on, you know, it, you go for what's the low hanging fruit, you know, and then so to, to teach your kids kindness to everybody, um, but also, you know, be the voice of, you know, be, be the man in the room, even if you're eight years old, you know, stand up and say that's not right. And if you see somebody doing something physical, um, you know, stand up for them. Um, and, you know, you might get your ass kicked in the process, but you'll grow more from that ass kicking than you were if you ran away. And the next day you see the kid that was getting bullied with two black eyes and you said, I, I ran away. And now he took the brunt of it. So, so, and, and it, it's, it's just a matter of, like I said, just, just trying to teach them to be strong, but also, um, you know, I, I want them to be sensitive to others as well. Um, but there's a time and a place for everything. So I know I'm, I'm, I don't back off when there's a, you know, time, time, like I said, time to get your hands dirty. So. So my last question would be, and then I'll give you an opportunity to kind of let us know where we can find you. My mm -hmm. last question would be, um, if you can go back and talk to yourself as a, you know, sophomore in high school, so say the 16 version of Ryan Durstein, what advice would you give to yourself? Probably do, do the things you were afraid of. You know, like when we talked about, like, I, I wish I hadn't deciding not to run sooner, you know, instead of being at 25, 26, um, being able to take the chance. Like you talked about with your son, like you, like right now I would kill to go back in time and, and, and play in front of my, you know, when I was, when I was a middle schooler and play in front of my grandparents who, you know, my grand, not, not around anymore and came to all my games, I would kill to go back and do it. But when I did it, I remember having angst, like being nervous and anxious and, oh my God, these people are watching me just to, it's easy in hindsight to do it, but I, but I would embrace, tell myself to it, to in, embrace that level of anxiety that comes with competition because competition is ultimately it's great for the soul and it's great for the body and it's great for the mind. Um, and to kind of like get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and, and, and to, to stand up, you know, there was times I'm sure where I ran when I was scared, um, that I probably could have, could have stood up for what, for what I, what I, what I probably knew was right. Um, but I probably ran for the fear of, uh, you know, getting my rear end kicked or, or, or something else. So, um, just, just to kind of go back and, you know, to, to try and let myself know, you know, like, life's bigger than just this moment yeah is this moment make the right decision like you know your your heart and your conscious always kind of tell you what's right we have an in, you know your instincts very rarely are wrong um so i would tell myself whatever your instincts like whatever your gut's telling you the first thought if you see a kid getting you know but should i help him well yeah i should help him but and they always say ignore whatever comes after the butt you know whatever comes after the butt is usually BS anyway, to talk yourself out of it. So whatever my initial thought would be, should I do this? Yes, it's the right thing to do. Well, then do the right thing regardless. Um, but like I said, it's, it's easier said as a 35, 40 year old male than it is a 16 year old kid because, uh, you know, you're just, it's a whole, you're a whole different place mentally. Um, and then the environment you're in as well. But no, I, I would, I think I'll tell myself, suck it up a little bit more and, uh, and, and, and be okay with the failure. So as I look, I, I, I always try to think about what to call an episode. And I, I don't think, okay, I'm going to, it's going to be about fitness and whatever. As we're discussing, I mean, I just love ignore everything after the butt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Overcoming, you know, embracing the suck and overcoming the fear. That's kind of what we talked yeah. about today. Over, For sure. We're kind of weaving it into to your journey. Um, yeah. So Ryan, tell us where we can find you. If people want to reach out to you um, and, and connect with you. 
So I have, a, I have a gym page on Facebook, Train for Life Strength and Conditioning. Uh, I'm available also I'm, uh, on um, Instagram. It's Train for Life Fitness. Um, just train it underneath all the words. It's just an uh, underscore Train for Life Fitness um, where, you know, daily, daily updates, um, you know, exercises, motivation, um, some, some eating stuff, just, you know, and then, and then just mindful practices you can do every day. Um, to help yourself not just get stronger in the gym, but ultimately how to make yourself grow, um, you know, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. So, um, yeah, like I said, Ryan Durstein on Facebook is a personal page. I take people there as well. But like I said, Train for Life Strength and Conditioning on Facebook and then on Instagram, it's Train for Life Fitness. So your Instagram page is excellent. I love seeing videos and they, they definitely motivate me. There are some, like you call them the zombie workouts. There are yep. some times that I wake up and I'm kind of dragging a little bit. And then you've already done four miles and I'm like, I'm like all right. but it, it definitely helps. And I really, the thing that I love the most is you're, you do a rant every once in a while. Oh, yeah. One that stood out to me just about, you know, it doesn't matter the letters that you have after your name. You know what yeah. I mean? It was something really that, that kind of struck a chord with me that you were, it wasn't about all this education that you have, right? No, I mean, it's, 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 it's one thing, you know, when I started at the gym, I was the only trainer without a college degree, but I had experience and I had a, a certification. So I had what I needed to work. And, you know, the, the fitness director was like, well, would you consider going back and finishing? And I said, well, is that going to, is that going to propel me to another category of trainer? He said, no. I said, well, I, I I've always learned by doing. And, and so over the course of, you know, people are always looking to get things added to the end of their name and that that's where they get their validity and that's where they get there. But, you know, I've talked with you know CEOs who go through the hiring process. They're like, I don't give a shit what college you went to. I can have a guy that went to a community college. That's going to outperform somebody that went to an Ivy league school because they're willing to, to get dirty and get experience. And ultimately school is great for memorizing and gaining knowledge, but the experience is ultimately where you see what really works uh, and, 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 and how to reach people. So, like I said, I don't, I don't down downplay. I think like I said, getting it for ex extending education is great. Um, but you gotta be willing one. Okay. Now your schooling's done. Well, now it's time for the real world. And I think a lot of time people just want to kind of put off having to go into the real world because it's work. Um, but you gotta be willing to work. You gotta be willing to admit, um, you know, where your shortcomings are. And like you stated earlier, finding people that motivate you, finding people that are going to, like you said, like I've already done four miles in the morning and I follow guys that have already done 10 miles in the morning. Right. So you always, there's, there's always someone that's, that's, that's pushing harder than you. And I always say, you know, keep your eyes on them. Um, and, 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 you know, try to keep propelling yourself forward and, and just not, um, worry so much about the things you read, you know, ultimately you can read a lot of things, but ultimately, you know, your, your experience is what's going to teach you the most in life. So. And I think more than ever now we've learned in the last year that, there are so many ways to educate yourself and learn outside of school. You know, there are some people like college is that's absolutely the right path for them. Other people it's not. And that's yeah. okay. I, I really believe that that's coming from a former, you know, middle school principal. I was a, an educator for 20 years and administrator for 15 out of the 20. And I, I'm saying, you know, college isn't for everyone anymore. And that, yeah. that's an okay thing. And we got to, yeah. we got to embrace that moving forward. So for what sure. I'll do is I will put um, ways to contact Ryan in the, show notes uh, on, on the podcast. I'll do a couple of posts, Ryan, with um, information about how people can find you. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. And there's so much more I want to talk to you about. I'd love oh, to, yeah. to meet in person too. Maybe you can Plenty more. put me in the ring and kick my ass a little bit. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Dust off the gloves. I don't know if I even have any more, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much for coming on. You got All it, brother. Right. Be well. Take care. You too.